Hey everyone. I uh, hope everyone's going well today. Uh, I've had a couple of rough days um, getting over this jet lag from Sydney. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. So I'm not sure how many people here have heard of Canva before or have maybe used it before, but our mission is really to empower the world to design. Um, we want anyone to be able to design anything and publish anywhere. And that's a really interesting challenge, both technically and in terms of like a product. Um, and luckily enough, I've been uh, really lucky to be part of Canva's hyper growth over the past few years. Um, so that's our mission, but what actually is Canva? So if you've ever used Canva, you're probably most familiar with the editor, and I've got a bit of editor inception going on here. That's me designing these slides. Um, it's a really simple way to create beautiful designs and presentations, infographics, t-shirts, all sorts of things. You name it, we can probably design it, and we can probably also print it. Uh, this jersey was actually printed with Canva. Um, we have more than 85 million people in more than 190 countries uh, that use Canva every month, and more than 10 billion designs have been created on Canva uh, to date. And it's actually funny, I was sort of nervous about this presentation because when I was drafting it, we didn't have 10 billion designs, and I really wanted a round number. Uh, it turns out, while well, I was way off, we, we absolutely smashed that, and we're actually quite a lot more than 10 million now. Probably gonna need a scale soon. So it's not just me that loves Canva. So many people love Canva in the world. Um, we're probably, yeah, as I say, we're probably gonna need more, add more shards like really soon. So um, the com combination of these factors, uh, the fact that we have so many designs, and uh, that the editor is so seamless means that it's a really tricky problem for a database platform. Um, and as you may have guessed, <laughs> given that we're here, we do actually use MongoDB for our main database. So before I, jump, uh, before I go on any further, a bit about me. So I'm Michael, <laughs> I've been working at Canva for a few years. I'm the team lead of the document service. Uh, which is the, the, the service within Canva, which is responsible for saving, loading, validating designs. That's sort of our key workload. Um, I'm originally from Wellington, New Zealand, so give or take a few million people. It's basically the same as New York City. Um, and yeah, uh, so how does Mongo fit into Canva? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, document service. Uh, we're res responsible for that saving and loading, and most of our workload uh, to Mongo is by key value, sort of um, give me a design, validate the design, um, save that design back to the database. We also serve a bunch of other uh, long tail sort of requests. So for instance, if you open up the home page, you might see a list of your designs, that's sort of, sort of by Mongo as well. Um, we also have some document lifecycle, but that really forms the uh, very long tail of our requests. So just a quick overview of uh, the document service. Back in 2012, Document Service was created along with Canva, um, and in 2013, we launched Canva to the world. So uh, back in 2013, the sort of picture of database uh, platforms looked quite different. Um, Canva, uh, MongoDB was only just new to the scene, um, and we were using Heroku at the time, and our CTO, Dave, really had a difficult decision which, uh, which Mongo provider was he gonna use. There were two at the time, uh, MLab and MongoHQ. So he made the very wise decision to base uh, which provider we'd use on the icon. We ended up using MongoHQ, and then we very quickly moved off MongoHQ uh, in that same year, because it turned out to me not, not too great. Uh, in 2015, we did a, a big change to our storage architecture. We moved to a system where we would uh, move our hot documents out into a S3 cache. 2017, we were really gr growing fast, and we moved to a sharded architecture. 2019, we moved to Atlas uh, after, Mongo, uh, after MLab was acquired. And in 2021, which is sort of what I'm gonna be talking about mainly in this talk today, uh, and it's sort of when I was really active at Canva, uh, we did a rebalance, and then we later moved to locally attached storage. So I sort of wanna highlight that pre-2021, uh, MongoDB was a really, um, pretty much a completely hands-off database within Canva. Nobody really had to think about it a lot. We sort of, as the product was evolving, we were throwing new schema, new features. Mongo just handled it. We didn't have to think about it at all. Um, and I'm not really sure if there are any other databases, uh, certainly in 2012, that would have been, been up for that challenge. Um, 
certainly that flexibility that it gave us in those early days was instrumental to our success. You know, we didn't have to think about what happened if we completely rewrote the front end. Mongo would just handle it. But, there's always a but, in sort of mid-2021, things were not great. Things were not hands-off. Uh, we started hitting a whole bunch of problems. And I'm sure everyone here has been in an outage or had some sort of incident. Um, and it's really not a fun time, both for engineers, but, but, uh, but also for users. Um, you can imagine Canva as, as a presentation platform. Imagine if I got it here today and my presentation didn't load. Or imagine if I was doing my, my thesis presentation and didn't, I, I just couldn't access Canva. That would really suck and it would really erode the trust of our users. Um, also, I really hate getting up at 2 a.m. Um, you guys have a really bad time zone for us in Sydney, so it's like 2 a.m. is like our peak traffic. So during this time, um, we were seeing three main problems. We had this inability to run the balancer. We were seeing really large latency spikes, and our disk utilization was pretty much at capacity. So what did we do? We jumped into analysis mode. Um, we really dropped all our work, and we said, what is wrong with our cluster? Why are we seeing so many issues? We engaged professional services, um, and they pretty, pretty quickly picked up on our really high disk utilization um, and sort of concluded that the disk uh, was, was caused by a in really ineffective cache, causing a really high, high write load to our cluster, and then eventually that was causing downstream failures. We're seeing lots of throttling, uh, latency, and just, yeah overall was not a great time. So I think any engineer at this point would just think, okay, well, why don't we just scale up the cluster? Um, theoretically, if we uh, have all of that discontention, just adding a few more, for m a few more nodes will mean that um, we get that extra capacity and we should alleviate any sort of problems we're having. It's a bit of a catch-22, so in order to add some more shards, you're gonna need a bit more uh, disk capacity in order to pull the data off um, but of course, we needed more shards to be able to do that. Um, and at this point, so we realized we're in a bit of a hole. And I'm sort of thinking to myself, what are we gonna do about this? You know, how am I gonna solve this problem? And I thought, hmm, maybe I should just quit and move to Atlassian. <laughs> Obviously not, no, that's not what I did. Uh, they also use Mongo, so. Um, <laughs> so we needed to add these shards without interrupting our production workload. Uh, and how are we gonna do that? Uh, it, well, Really, adding shards is quite easy. You just add some shards. Uh, the problem is actually balancing the data across onto those shards um, and running the balancer. So we weren't able to run the balancer effectively, and all we could really do was um, try and basically throttle the balancer the most we could. There's no, not actually any uh, functionality in order to, to throttle that balancer, so what we ended up doing was setting the wait for delete to true and our write concern to the maximum we could, and that was sort of okay. We also added a, a, a um, balancing window, but of course, 190 countries, it's tricky to sort of have a, any, any off-peak time. So this sort of got us through. It took three months to add three shards, which is not ideal. Um, but we did see a little bit of a reduction in these latency spikes, so we were getting, we were thinking, okay, we're, maybe we're on the right track. Um, but it was sort of quite quickly apparent to us that this new capacity was being eaten up very quickly. So we, we changed our mindset and we said, okay, instead of you know, sharding for today, what if we shard for three months in the future? And that led us to very quickly move from six to nine to 12 to 17 to 20 shards within the space of about six months. But all through this, we're sort of scratching our heads still because the balancer was just not, not playing ball. We were still seeing huge problems whenever we ran the balancer. Um, so, you know, we're, we're stuck with this problem, but very important part of being a software engineer is we really needed to go to lunch. And luckily, the MongoDB team brought us out to lunch, and on that very day, I remember this very clearly, shit hit the fan. So, as we were all preparing, we, like, the Canva just went down. The whole thing was unreachable. Uh, and it was down for about an hour, and it was very quickly evident that it was our team's uh, service that was causing this, this failure. Um, so we, we did relatively uh, quickly figure out that the balancer was the problem here. The balancer had all of a sudden just kicked into gear and it was doing a whole bunch of work. So disabling the balancer brought us back to service, um, 
but now we knew that there was something wrong with our cluster and uh, like we, we can't operate without the balancer. Um, one other key thing that we noticed was that uh, as, as we were looking through the metrics, uh, our, the number of chunks in our cluster had some, for some reason skyrocketed from about 400,000 to just over a million chunks. And we didn't actually know a lot about chunks. So I guess um, it's probably a bit of, it's, it's a good time to give a bit of background. So what is a chunk? So essentially in MongoDB, you have uh, documents and your documents exist within some sort of key space. Now that key space is divided into chunks and this is all specific to a sharded cluster by the way. So your key space is, is, is divided into these chunks and these chunks are defined by the ranges that live on the, key, uh, on the, on the config server. The config server also maps these ranges to specific shards. Um, so at Canva, we use a hashed ID, which means that our documents generally fall within a uniform distribution across that entire key space. That also means that when we insert a document, uh, one of our chunks will grow on average, and uh, as those chunks grow, their size becomes larger, and they, they will exceed the maximum chunk size, and at that point, they are split into two. So you can probably guess, this is sort of what was happening on that day. Um, it's also worth noting that when a, when a chunk splits, that's not actually doing anything, it's just a metadata operation. Um, so theoretically, a chunk split shouldn't be that impactful. So in our cluster, uh, the professional services team from Mongo uh, were looking at what was going on and it turns out that any little metadata update was causing anywhere from a one second to a five minute stall in our cluster. So you can imagine that going from 400,000 chunks to a million chunks of which each of those changes is a metadata change was not great for our performance. Um, so we sort of took a step back um, and, and thought why us? You know, our MongoDB rep uh, sort of says, sort of waxes lyrical about Mongo um, and says, you know, there's, there's customers with massive data sets and, and massive uh, collections. But we were sort of unique in that we have one cluster with one collection with a million chunks. Um, and it's because our, our documents are fairly large, um, given that our, our product has sort of evolved over the years and we put more and more stuff into our documents. Um, so, so this fact meant that our chunks were growing quite rapidly and we ended up with a, quite a lot of chunks, so a million chunks. So what was the fix? Uh, so there were sort of three main areas that we, we wanted to fix with our cluster. Uh, the first was obviously to reduce the number of chunks, that was first and foremost. The second was to reduce that disk contention however we could, and the third was to reduce the size of documents so we could stop this sort of chunk split problem from happening in future. So, in relation to uh, reducing the number of chunks, we divided this work into sort of two phases. The first phase was just like, how do we go back to yesterday? How do we reverse that chunk split? And then the second phase was sort of more forward looking, like maybe we do this, maybe we don't. Um, how, do we, how do we really reduce our cluster, our, our chunk count down to a normal amount? So phase one, um, this was a really naive approach. We essentially just took, uh, uh, any chunk, any contiguous chunk on a specific shard and just merged it unconditionally. Uh, sorry, I, I should note that there is actually no way uh, supported by MongoDB in order to reduce the number of chunks. So this was all tooling that we had to build internally um, with collaboration with MongoDB. So after running this first script, uh, it took a few weeks to run this, just merging those chunks as, as quickly as we could. We ended up going from about a 20% failure rate uh, whenever a node rebooted in our cluster down to about a 4% failure rate. Um, and we went from about a million back down to about 400,000 chunks. So this was an awesome improvement, uh, but we still were really not happy with that 4% failure rate. So moving on to, uh, also the other problem, uh, the, the naive approach that we took uh, meant that all of our chunks, well some of our chunks were wildly different in size. Uh, and this of course is a problem if the balancer takes those chunks and starts moving them around and maybe you get a bunch of large chunks on one shard and a bunch of sh small chunks on another, all of a sudden you have a hot shard, which is not an ideal situation. So phase two, this is a bit of a, the output from the, um, from the script that we wrote. Essentially what this does is uh, we, we picked a number, 150,000 chunks, and we said, all right, create a split point here, 
and then just merge everything in that split point. Uh, we were quite worried about this because that's a lot of metadata operations that we needed to perform. Uh, and we predicted that it would take about four months for us to run that script. It ended up taking about three months to run, but by the end of, the, by the end of that, uh, we had some massive improvements in our cluster's performance. We also didn't have to throttle that script towards the end because now metadata updates were pretty much a no-op. So uh, as the slide says, we went from about a 4% failure rate down to just under 1% uh, failure whenever we had a node reboot. So where are we at? Our inability to run the balancer was pretty much solved. Um, we were all good on that front. However, we were still seeing these latency spikes and we still saw our disks pretty much at capacity the entire time. So what was the cause of this poor disk performance? Um, our application was surprisingly sensitive to any sort of latency within EBS. Um, a lot of our incidents were sort of put down to the fact that we were getting noisy neighbors within EBS, and uh, a lot of those incidents were also caused by the fact we have a lot of uh, fan out queries. So a fan out query is where you have one query that goes to a, a Mongo S and is fanned out to a Mongo D, uh, to all of your Mongo Ds. So any sort of latency on any node was causing a whole cascading failure into our application. So we really needed a plan in order to uh, solve this EBS problem. And the, the uh, ideal solution for us was uh, to move to locally attached storage. Um, we initially tried uh, moving to a secondary read model, so an eventually consistent model for our fan out queries, but we found all sorts of problems, we had all sorts of problems with um, secondary reads. So moving to locally attached storage comes with a whole bunch of challenges, especially when you have pretty much zero disk capacity in order to actually move, do the migration. So we formulated a, a six-step plan for us to move from EBS to locally attached NVMe. Uh, the first was to sort of deal with the durability uh, uh, differences you get with locally attached storage. So we moved to a five-node replica set. So this, was me this would mean that we can lose a few nodes before we start getting nervous about potentially having to look at our backups. Um, the next step was to move to 4.4. This would give us a couple of things. It would give us sync source preference and hedge reads. So uh, enabling us to set the sync source preference was essentially a mitigation uh, on our primaries. When we, did that, when we did that move from locally attached, sorry, from EBS to locally attached, we weren't gonna put a whole lot of load on our primaries if we're syncing from our secondaries. Enabling hedge reads was to uh, try and alleviate uh, some of that long tail latency when I was talking about uh, latency spikes on specific nodes, hedge reads essentially you're sending your query to two nodes and whichever node responds first, you're gonna use that result. The next step was to scale vertically. Uh, so this was just CPU and memory. We really wanted to eliminate any sort of bottleneck. And finally, uh, we would hit the button and migrate to NVMe. So it all went perfectly, right? Um, well, no. So we did see two incidents um, and the reason we actually did this plan in the first place, or one of the main reasons uh, we were so nervous is because we had seen so many incidents uh, just with resyncing and, and various other changes that we had been making. So this first change, uh, moving to a five node replica set, uh, was an interesting one. So when you're moving from uh, EBS, or when you're adding new EBS nodes to your cluster in Atlas, uh, those EBS nodes don't do a full initial sync, they do a partial sync, which an optimized sync, I think they call it, uh, which makes total sense. But little do we know that when those EBS nodes are added, uh, the data isn't actually really available. It's lazily loaded into, uh, onto, onto the volume. And of course we were using secondary reads and as soon as those nodes went into the cluster, we were hammering them with traffic, which just completely made our application sort of uh, not work. Um, so that was a fun one. Uh, we, I think that was about a half an hour outage and we just had to uh, disable those secondary reads. Move, upgrading to 4.4 went, went okay and then setting the sync source preference was another really interesting one. So uh, most of our changes sort of involve infrastructure changes and they take a bit of time so it's a gradual rolling of nodes. This one was pretty much instant so we weren't really worried about it. However, when, when 100 nodes came up, they were hammering D, uh, AWS's DNS and uh, all of a sudden we got throttled on DNS and none of our nodes could talk to each other and that was game over. Um, so it took about 10 minutes or so before those DNS queries slowly got through and our, our cluster came back um, 
uh, naturally. The rest of the steps actually went surprisingly well. Um, I shouldn't say surprisingly. Um, migrating to NVMe was a really interesting one. We predicted it would take about a day. It turns out it took about a week. Um, and during that time, there was a, so we run our entire cluster in US East 1. Uh, during that time, there was a massive incident in US East 1 with uh, EC2. And that's when you basically weren't able to start new EC2 nodes for a whole day. Uh, we lost 14 nodes during our migration, and that's the most nodes we've ever lost. Um, but as you can see, this was really a huge success. Uh, it it's, was really night and day change for us, moving from EBS to NVMe, and you can sort of see on this graph, like we were seeing these latency spikes and these blips, and then it was just clear sailing after that. So at this point, uh, we were pretty golden. Uh, we were able to run the balancer. We, our large spikes in latency were pretty much all gone and our disk utilization was pretty much sitting at zero, um, given NVMe just has so, or locally attached disks have so much more throughput and so many more IOPS. So, back to our old ways. In 2022, things have been pretty much hands off. Um, we have made, no, it's, that's not quite true, we have made, we are making significant changes to our architecture. Um, we're trying to really pare down the amount of information that we've got in our, in our documents and pull stuff out where it makes sense. Um, but that being said, MongoDB remains an absolutely fantastic choice for our data store. Um, our application is still evolving day by day, and it, the, the, the uh, document model gives us so much flexibility. Um, sort of a key takeaway for me from this has been that sharding is great, but it really needs to always be viewed in context, and it's never a silver bullet. Um, so we always like to follow the beaten path for, uh, and, and uh, we thought we were following the beaten path here, but we sort of ran into this problem where actually we would have had trouble throwing more money at this problem. We really needed to change how our application was using the database um, or, and vertically scale the database. Um, I also think another thing that has been hugely beneficial is the incident review process at Canva. Um, I don't think we would have caught these issues nearly as quickly as we did if we didn't have such a thorough incident review process. So every single little spike in latency, every single little blip, uh, we're looking at and we're trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Suddenly our NTSC or our, uh, Mongo support can vouch for that. Cool, so I hope that's been really interesting um, for everyone. I'm really happy to take any questions if anyone has, has them. Do we need a microphone or? Yeah, yeah, so uh, we were in a situation where we had a bunch of chunks that were all varied in size, uh, and, and they were also um, not contiguous on specific shards. So the problem was really, we needed to take all of this random assortment of chunks, and we want to end up with a distribution of chunks which is uniform across the cluster, and a size that is uniform across the cl cluster. So we took the key space, we divided it into 150,000 uh, partitions, and then for each partition, we would take that range, we would look at every chunk within that range and move it to a destination shard, and then we would merge all of those chunks. So that left us with, with <laughs> funny story, I made an off by one error in our script, so we actually have 150,000 and one chunks. Um, but those chunks are all exactly the same size, and it's, um, yes, very nice. Yeah, so we, we looked into this. Um, it's, it's complicated, but uh, my understanding, or the understanding we left it at, was that essentially our cluster is very, very old or has a lot of lineage. Um, so we started on uh, a replica set, and then we moved to a single, single node or a single shard, sharded cluster. Um, and then as the cluster grew in size, those chunks uh, were sort of spread uh, haphazardly around the, around the cluster. Um, I don't think we ever figured out exactly why we ended up with a whole bunch, a whole assortment of sizes, but my understanding, well, actually, uh, so when that chunk split happened, the balancer was acting very quickly and started moving chunks around, which meant that that phase one uh, approach, which just uh, merged contiguous chunks, 
obviously caused an imbalance in those sizes. So those are a couple of the reasons. Um, happy to talk about it outside if we if you want to okay. go into more detail. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> My boss is laughing. Um, so it was pretty much just me um, working, <laughs> working on this problem. <laughs> um, I can tell you, my girlfriend got a lot of information about chunks and sharding. Um, it was a very stressful like six or seven months that we were working on this. Uh, but the team, uh, my, my team is uh, five strong. So there's five of us in the document database. Uh, could I op open source the script? Uh, yes, I could open source it. Uh, I'll have to check with legal, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually not particularly difficult. Um, we just did a lot of verification and validation. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the balancer off. <laughs> Um, that was our plan just for, for a short period of time. We just wanted to chill out. Um, but we raised the maximum chunk size to be significantly uh, larger. Um, and then we talked to MongoDB and said, hey, can you guys fix this chunking problem? Um, so there are a lot of improvements that are coming in future versions of Mongo that hopefully alleviate a lot of these problems. Yeah, actually, yeah. So we're twenty shards by five nodes in each shard. Yeah. So we moved to a five-node replica set mainly for durability concerns. Um, so we didn't want to be in a situation where we lose a couple of locally attached nodes um, because you can potentially lose data if you lose an entire shard. Potentially, we also leverage secondary reads and hedged reads, which means that if we ever um, have a particularly high, eventually consistent read load, we can leverage all of those shards in our production, sorry, all of those nodes in our production uh, workload. Is this using Atlas? Yes, all of this is using Atlas. Cool. Oh, yep. Yes, yeah, so this is sort of an active area that we're still working on. Um, obviously, 10 billion rows, it's difficult to sort of make that migration happen overnight. Um, we, w one of the big challenges we face at Canva is how to deal with large content, and obviously that falls a lot on our, onto our team. So we're looking at ways to make our document model uh, sort of more suited to smaller doc documents. Um, so, but specifically, we have um, a lot of features that we are basically just taking out of our main collection and moving into a separate collection. Yes. Um, so this is an interesting one. My understanding, um, happy to be corrected, is that basically you should try and keep your documents as small as possible, especially if you only need a small portion. So, so one of the things that professional services was talking to us about is you've really got to tune your documents for your workload, uh, which is where we fell short in many areas. So for instance, you might have a session that's open on a document, and every five minutes you might need to reopen that session, and that involves writing one particular field. Um, of course, if you have a 16 megabyte document and you're using disk level encryption plus compression, writing that one field may result in writing that entire document, um, which is obviously, that's not your workload. Your workload is just updating that one field. So really you wanna keep your workload aligned to your document sizes. Yep. 20, 20 shards. Uh, at the moment, each shard is about one terabyte in size. Yeah. And so for context, about 5% of our data is of our design data is stored within Mongo, and the rest is in a cold, cold storage here. 
at the moment, we have three collections. <laughs> but previously, we were on one collection. So we did, but um, we never really needed to. Um, our data model made the most sense in a single collection. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, yep. Not really. This maybe is something that we want to look into in the future with a good load testing framework. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely something that we've been talking with professionals with us about. Okay, I'm getting the. Uh, I'm getting the the nods, but I'm happy to talk outside. Cool. All right, everyone, give it up for Michael. <laughs> Thank you all so much for attending the session. Michael will be outside, so if you have any more questions, please do take that in. We need to get.